Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves vessels for your use. Yield now to your Holy Spirit in your name we pray. The saints said in agreement, Amen. Amen. Satan, we bind you, all territorial yes, spirits, Father. all principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places, territorials, elementals, and strong men, familiars, ancestrals, disembodied spirits, disembodied souls, all who project all on assignment, all entities not of the Holy Spirit. We are loosed, you are cast out and down and bound off. And the saints said in agreement, Amen. We bind up and off all retaliations and counterattacks and decree them forbidden. All in Christ Jesus' name, the saints said in agreement. Amen. Amen. July uh, 18, 2010. The church that could not because it would not. We're preaching about the church that could not preach the fullness of the truth of the Word of God because it would not receive the fullness of the truth of the Word of God. And not a criticism, but an observation of the prophetic verse of 2 Thessalonians 2 3 that says, In the last days, the apostasy will come. The, uh, falling away of the church from preaching truth to preaching error. And one of the doctrines that we have been examining has been the false doctrine of hell and eternal damnation. In our last session, we examined the history of the doctrine. And we quoted four or five pagan historians, all of whom admitted that the doctrine was contrived to scare the masses into behaving morally because it was basically an immoral society. We then went in and quoted Augustine, who in his own writings admitted that hell and damnation was a pagan contrivance used to control the masses to try to make them more uh, moral and society more civil. Uh, interestingly, as I mentioned in the last session, even though Augustine admitted to this, it still ended up being that uh, he incorporated those doctrines into Roman Catholic theology. So around 400 AD, after 400 or 500 years of the early church preaching that Christ is Savior of all, that Christ saves all, that Christ will restore all, okay, which is uh, the true gospel of Christ, 1 Timothy 4.10, okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 28, okay, that they eliminated the doctrine of the restoration of all and replaced it with salvation for some and damnation for others. And so we went through that history, and then we started to examine to see whether Scripture can confirm history. And one of the things we did was we explored the three uh, words for hell in New Testament Scripture, that is Gehenna, Hades, and Tartarus. And we began the discussion of the use of Gehenna. And we said... In the Old Testament, it is used uh, three or four times, and every time it is used, the word is translated the Valley of Hinnom correctly. When we get to the New Testament, we discover that every time the word Gehenna is used, it is translated as hell. Now there's something wrong with that, isn't there? And what it means is that the scriptures have been tampered with. The scriptures have been altered, and as we have gone along over the past weeks of this study, we have demonstrated very clearly and in no uncertain terms that the alterations of scripture always seem to center around the words hell, damnation, judgment, destruction, punishment, mm -hmm. almost exclusively. The rest of the Bible seems to be translated pretty well. Okay? Now, why is it that those scriptures in particular have been tampered with? Okay? There's not a lot of people out there that want you to hear that the scriptures have been tampered with. They want you to believe 
that the Bible is inerrant and inspired and without error. It is God's truth. Well, I've got news for you. The translations have been tampered with and there are errors in the translation. And the Bible that is inerrant and inspired and without error are the original manuscripts given by the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament Hebrew and in the New Testament Greek. What man does with those manuscripts is an entirely different thing. And the proof of that is that we have new editions of the Bible coming out every year because it's constantly being <coughs> corrected and rewritten. Okay? If it was perfect and inspired and inerrant without mistake to begin with, when it was first translated, then why do we have to keep republishing it? Say? And so we've got lots of fuzzy thinking in the end time carnal church. Okay? That needs to be clarified. Those who worship Christ must worship in spirit and in truth. Truth is the criteria. And the scripture says, tell them the truth in love, but the implication is, but tell them the truth. Okay? If we love people enough, if we love the body of Christ enough, we will tell them the truth. Then we will prove to them the truth. And that's what we're in the process of doing right now. So let's continue. And let me point out to you that the idea of hell and damnation was never in the heart of God. The proof scripture, as we used it last week and we'll use it again today, is Jeremiah 32.35. Jeremiah 32.35. And in way of brief review, listen to what it says. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom. There's the word Gehen. Okay to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not. This is God talking. Now listen to what he says. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Here God says putting people in fire, okay, never entered his heart. Okay? And is of an abomination. That's God's opinion of it. The end time church teaches that although God doesn't put people through fire on the earth that he does in the afterlife. And that that is what hell and damnation is all about. Well, if God would not do it in this life, why in the world would he do it in the afterlife if it's an abomination to him? Hmm? Does someone have an answer? There is no answer. Because if it's an abomination here, it's, abomina it's an abomination in the afterlife. Okay? Now, I told you before that in that verse of Jeremiah 32, 35, neither came it into my mind. In the original Hebrew, it doesn't say that. In the original Hebrew, it says, nor did it come up in my heart. The heart of the Father is not to torture people. The heart of the Father is not to put people through fire. The heart of the Father is contrary to that. God calls it an abomination. But the earthly carnal church, the apostate church, takes pagan doctrine and incorporates it into Christian teaching. The mixture of pagan things with the things of God is the sin of syncretism. That's what happened when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the commandments a second time. And then as he went up on Mount Sinai, Aaron and the Israelites started building the golden calf. So they were receiving the word of God and worshiping an Egyptian god at the same time. Okay? And that was the sin of syncretism. In Jeremiah... Then they went, when they went to the temple and they came home, they either decorated a Christmas tree or they baked rice cakes to the Queen of Heaven, which was the Persian goddess uh, Ishtar, from which we get the word Easter. Okay? And in the process of doing so, they were mixing pagan things 
with the things of God. And Jeremiah called him on the carpet and said, you bake rice cakes to the queen of heaven. In other words, you're mixing things of pagan religion with things of God. Syncretism. Okay? Has the church done any different than Israel's sins? And the answer to that is no. At some time in our lives, we're all guilty. But we've got to admit it and repent of it and walk away from it. Grace demands a response. When God gives you the grace of greater revelation and higher knowledge, that demands a response. You've got to respond to that grace, and the response is trust on the Word and obedience. And by the Word, I mean the original uh, manuscripts. Say, lots of Christians, okay, are students of the translations, but they're not students of the Word. Okay? Because if you're a true student of the Word, okay, you'll have several books at home where you can, in several translations of the Bible, where you can cross-reference and check them one against the other, <coughs> verse against verse, to be sure of what people are translating and saying. See? You'll have a Hebrew-English dictionary. You'll have a Greek-English dictionary. Okay? You don't have to be a, a Hebrew scholar. Okay? Or a Greek scholar. All you have to do is know the meaning of the word. Okay? There are lots of people out there that want you to believe that to know the Word of God truly, that you've got to be a scholar of Greek and you've got to be able to parse the words, uh, okay? And that, or you have to be a, a, a scholar of Paleo Hebrew or Hebrew and you've got to be able to uh, uh, tell the different verb forms, okay? Listen, what you need to do is know the meaning of the word. There are plenty of computer programs out there now that do all that for you. Okay? And act as your peripheral brain for you. Say, so that you can study those words and see for yourself and compare one program to another. The chance of you being in error probably are less than 1 or 2% when you use multiple programs to check your, your scholarship. Okay? Everybody should be able to do a word study and, and use multiple books to look up things and take the time. Uh, Timothy says, study to show yourself approved of God. Huh? Study. Okay? So, when we go into this and examine this then, what do we see? In the Old Testament, there are three Scriptures, Joshua 15.8, Joshua 18.16, Nehemiah 11.30, that use the word Gehenna and translate it correctly as Valley of Hinnom. Well, let's leave the Old Testament. Let's find out what happened in the New Testament and how did it happen. That's the next question. Well, we know how it happened. It happened through Augustine, Jerome and the King James translators. It happened through the Latin Vulgate Bible, which the King James translators used in part or almost whole to translate uh, the Bible into the vernacular English, passing the translation through four different languages before you or I ever got a copy. Uh, so, turn with me now and let's look at some of these things and watch what happens <coughs> when we use the proper meaning for Gehenna. Keep in mind that these scriptures I'm going to read you are scriptures in which Gehenna is translated as hell. When Jesus was talking about Gehenna, as I've told you before, which was the city dump, at the southeast corner of Jerusalem where the refuge burned all night and all day. What he was talking about was a type, a metaphor for the lake of fire. Judgment is in the lake of fire, not in hell. The word hell is a pagan contrivance. Okay? So now watch what happens. Okay? 
when we uh, apply this. I'm going to take you through every scripture in the New Testament that has to do with hell, whether it's Gehenna, Hades, or Tartarus. And by the time we are done, I want to demonstrate to you that the word hell does not exist in the Bible. Now, we already covered the word Sheol in the Old Testament. I said to you that 31 times it was translated as the grave, 31 times it was translated as hell, and one time it's uh, translated as the pit. Okay? Now, that is by the King James translators, and I'm sure also by Augustine and Jerome. But the word Sheol in the Old Testament, as we said uh, uh, in the recent past, does not mean hell, nor does it mean the grave. It means the unseen. And it actually refers to the death state, okay, of both believers and unbelievers. The condition of death is what it refers to. So in actuality, there is no mention of hell in the Old Testament. It's a mistranslation of the word, arbitrarily assigned definition. Because that's not what the Paleo-Hebrew means. Not only that, there, that means in turn that there is no Old Testament seed type for a New Testament reality of hell. Okay? Now let's look at the New Testament and let's find out, is this really true? Because if it's really true, we ought to be able to dispel every verse in which hell is used and show that it doesn't refer to the pagan hell, but is meant to refer to the lake of fire. Okay? All right. Go to Matthew 5.22. We're going to skip around Matthew a little bit. Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, before you do that, go to Matthew 10.28. We'll do it in order. 10, 1, no, I'm sorry. Matthew 5.22. <laughs> Matthew 5.22. Listen to what it says. I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Okay, there is the word Gehenna. I've got news for you. Gehenna is a proper noun. Proper noun is the name of a place. Name of a place doesn't need the translation. Proper nouns do not need the translation. They are what they are. Okay. What was Jesus saying? You will be put on the refuge heap, the garbage heap. Okay? Guess what? All garbage has to be treated. You don't just let garbage alone. You do something with it. Okay? That's why we said the lake of fire in the Greek, the Greek word theon, which means God, is God fire or spirit fire. The Gospel of John says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of life, not death, not eternal death, eternal damnation, but life. Huh? And Paul says in Hebrews 12, 29, that our God is a consuming fire. So when Jesus is using Gehenna here, he's using it as a metaphor for the lake of fire. Okay? The place of cleansing. The uh, place of purging. It's interesting that the actual word is lake of fire and brimstone. Now brimstone is the Greek word for sulfur. Okay? And sulfur was used commonly in all of the countries of the Middle East for as a medicinal for purging and purification. See? <clears throat> so when the Holy Spirit chose that word, lake of fire and brimstone, 
Okay, he was doing that because he knew that that ministered to the people. The meaning of the lake of fire. Say that it was a place of cleansing. Our God is a consuming fire. I'm going to show you more of that uh, a little later. So here. It says, you will be in danger not of hellfire, you'll be in danger of Gehenna, the lake of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, there is a punishment. We said that the word for punishment in the Greek is not a punishment of vengeance, it's a punishment of correction. Okay? As a matter of fact, that Greek word, colossus, okay, used for punishment, uh, always is better translated chastisement. Chastisement is a punishment of correction. You chastise children, don't you? Okay? You chastise children. See, and that's what the uh, actual appropriate translation of Colossus is, is chastisement. So it's a place okay, where sin is dealt with. And it says, for ages and ages. No wonder there's a weeping and gnashing of teeth. Huh? It's not a pleasant thing to go through. But if you didn't have a Savior, okay, and you're under law, law is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, okay, so you work out by the Holy Spirit the sins you committed and you take the correction for However, he does that. So here we see that when it says they shall be in danger of hellfire, that's a mistranslation of Gehenna. They shall be in danger of the lake of fire. Alright? How about the same chapter, 529? And if your right eye offends you, pluck it out, cast it from you. For it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. No. That your whole body should be cast into Gehenna. The lake of fire. Jesus again is speaking metaphorically. A metaphor is something that stands in to represent something else. Okay? Jesus was using the city dump. Okay? The place where all refuse is burned. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear them which is able to destroy, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. No, the word is Gehenna. Gehenna doesn't need translating. Okay? A type of the lake of fire. Matthew 18, 9. And if your eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Gehenna, again, wrong translation. Okay? It's Gehenna fire, a type of the lake of fire. Matthew 23, 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. No. The word is not hell. The word is Gehenna. Gehenna doesn't need translating. It's a proper noun. Okay? It's a type of the lake of fire. Okay? Matthew 23, 33. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? No, Gehenna, the city dump, the lake of fire, in time. Now what have I just showed you? I've showed you that there are six verses in the Gospel of Matthew, all translated as hell, using the word Gehenna, and not a single one of them mean hell. Okay? Now how do you know that? Because when Jesus was using the word Gehenna, he was talking to Jews of Jerusalem. 
And Jews of Jerusalem all knew what Gehenna was. It was the city dump at the southeast end of the city. They all knew what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about people who did not receive Him, whose lives were wasted by sin and were worthy of nothing else but the garbage heap. So he was talking about Gehenna as a type of the lake of fire. Okay? Where worm dieth not. Where worm dieth not. Okay? People like to argue, well, that means because the fires of Gehenna kept going day and night in Jerusalem, that the food in the refuge there was food for worms and the worms kept reproducing. Well, that may or may not be true. I don't know. Okay? But in Old Testament typology, worm refers to people. Okay? In Isaiah 41.10, God said to, J to Jacob, I will help you, Jacob, you worm, and all Israel. In other words, they're <coughs> worms too. Okay? Notice where worm dieth not. In other words, in the lake of fire, there's no body to perish. It's soul and spirit. Soul and spirit cannot die, contrary to what some people teach. How do you know that, Burn? Because God has a soul, and it isn't dead, and we're in His image and likeness. And He said to the Israelites in the Old Testament, if you obey, my soul will not abhor you. My soul will not hate you. Okay, And Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 17, the night before he died, my soul is in anguish. Okay, So Jesus has a soul, the Father has a soul. They are spirit. Right? You're in the image and likeness of God. Okay, So God has a permanent spirit and a permanent soul. Okay, You have a permanent spirit and a permanent soul. Because you are in is image and light. Soul is mind, will, emotions. Spirit is conscience and intuition. Okay? And life force. Okay? Turn to Mark. Chapter 9. Let me just run through these quickly. Mark 9, verse 43, 45, 47. 43, 45, 47. And if your hand offend you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. No, the word is not hell. The word is Gehenna. Verse 45. And if your foot offend you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter halt into life then have two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. No, not hell. Gehenna. Verse 47. And if your eye offend you, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. No, not hell. Gehenna. Three mistranslations. Okay? If Gehenna means the valley of Hinnom in the Old Testament, Gehenna means the valley of Hinnom, or the word Gehenna is its name in the Hebrew, its proper name. It means what it is. It doesn't mean hell. Okay? So here, the use of Gehenna in the Gospel of Mark as meaning hell is dispelled. It doesn't mean hell. Okay? In Luke chapter 12, verse 5, we read, But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he is killed is power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. There's the word Gehenna, not hell. But they translated hell. So in the Gospel of Luke, the word Gehenna is mistranslated. And the word hell, <coughs> uh, Gehenna, does not mean hell. James 3, verse 6. 
And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it is defiled, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. No, on fire of Gehenna. It's translated hell, it doesn't mean hell. What have I done? I have shown you all of the instances of the New Testament in which Gehenna is translated hell and shown you that that word is mistranslated. It doesn't mean hell at all. Okay? Now let's look at Hades. In the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16, 19, which many people uh, love to use and quote as a proof that hell exists, Okay, we read uh, in uh, Luke 16, 23, and in hell he lifts up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay, now the word there for hell is Hades. Hades does not mean hell. Hades is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament Hebrew Sheol, which means the unseen, the unperceived, or the death state. Okay? The death state. Not hell. Hades never means hell. Hades, uh, in the New Testament, in the context in which it is used, is nowhere near the equivalent of what Hades is represented <coughs> as in Greek mythology or the understanding uh, of Hades that the Greeks had. The early New Testament people had no such recognition. But what we see here is that it's referring to the unseen or the unperceived, the death state. As a matter of fact, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man had nothing at all to do with hell. Every rabbi for 150 to 200 years before Christ knew about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Okay? But they didn't understand the significance of the teaching until Jesus said this parable to the Pharisees themselves, pointing out to them that it was referring to them and their ministry, not referring to hell and damnation. You see, the rich man in typology represented Israel, and the poor man represented the Gentile nation surrounding who had seen the God of Israel and all of his power working with the Israelites. And they were thirsty to know more about God, and they wanted to know more about God. But the Israelites, who were rich in revelation, okay, kept the knowledge from all the pagan nations particularly the Pharisees. Even at the time of Christ, they refused to share their revelation of the Old Testament word and scriptures with the pagan nations. You see? The rich man represented, the, represented Israel and particularly the Pharisees. Okay? The poor man represented the Gentile nations who didn't know God but saw the wonders and the power of God and wanted to know more about Him and the rich man would not share that treasure, would not share those riches. That's what the real meaning of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man represents. Okay? That's what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. Okay, you are the rich man. Say, you will end up, okay, in the death state, which is eventually thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, there's another mistranslation. Death and hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. The word there for hell is Hades. Okay, Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. No, that means the death state or the death condition. Okay, will be thrown into the lake of fire. Huh? Okay? So here we see that that doesn't mean, Hades there does not mean hell. 
How about in uh, Revelations 2014, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. That doesn't mean hell. Okay? That's the death state that's thrown into the lake of fire. Then go to Revelations uh, 118. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. No. Hades again. Not hell. I have the keys of the death state and death. The spirit of death. Okay? Now that's quite a different thing than hell, isn't it? Okay? There's Hades again. That's dispelled. Revelation 6.8. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. No, the death state followed with him. Hades. And power was given unto them for the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Okay? No, that's Hades. That's not hell. That's the death. Death and the death state. Revelations 20.13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. No, not death and hell. Hell, there is Hades. It's death and the death state. Delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. There's no hell there. No word for hell there. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The word for grave here is Hades. Isn't that interesting? Instead of translating it hell, here they translate it grave. How could it be both? See? Grave, of course, is a closer translation because grave refers to the death state, doesn't it? See? So that's at least a little closer, okay? But it means neither. It means the unseen. Okay? Watch this. Acts 2, verse 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, and his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Speaking of Jesus. Okay? His soul was not left in hell. No, his soul was not left in Hades, the death state. Okay? His soul was not left in Hades, the death state. Okay? Some people pray the Apostles' Creed. He ascended into heaven the third day. Uh, he arose again from the dead. He descended into hell. No, he didn't. Jesus never went to hell. That's what this says right here. Let me read it to you again. So there's no question. He seeing this before spake of the resur resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell. No, his soul was not left in the death state. Doesn't that make more sense? Yes. That means he resurrected. Huh? Okay. His soul was not left in the death state. He never went to hell. He was in the death state. Okay? Neither did his flesh see corruption. Okay? Let's look uh, at Hades in Matthew 16, 18. I say unto you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church in the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's the word Hades for hell. No. The gates of the death state shall not prevail against it. Or the gates of the unseen. Luke 10, 15. And you, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. Pretty impressive. The problem is, the word Hades doesn't mean hell. Okay, you Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to the unseen or the death state. Luke 16, 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. No, we just said that that didn't mean hell.
hell where he lifted up his eyes. It was in the unseen or the death state. Okay? Acts 2.27 Because you will not, this is uh, quoted as Jesus, because you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. See? These are arguments that say, well, Jesus went to hell after death uh, to show himself to the damned. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, it should read, because you will not leave my soul in Hades, you will not leave my soul in the unseen, in the death state. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Okay? Now, what have I done so far? I've shown you all the scriptures of the New Testament in which Gehenna is used to mean hell. I've shown you all the scriptures of the New Testament in which Hades is used to mean hell. I've shown you that none of them mean hell. They're all mistranslations of arbitrarily assigned definitions to those words that don't mean those things. And that their true meaning can only be derived from looking at the ancient Greek and at the ancient Hebrew. Okay. One last verse in the New Testament for the word help, Tartarus. 2 Peter 2 4. Okay. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be, to be reserved unto judgment. Okay, Tartarus. Now, by tradition, Tartarus has been translated as hell one time and refers only to fallen angels. Okay, in the chaining of fallen angels. Okay, the word Tartarus does not mean hell. The literal translation of the word Tartarus means caverns of gloom. Caverns of gloom. Okay? And traditionally, it has been understood from ancient times to the present that it represented a area, if you will, for lack of a better term, of Hades or the death state that was used to sequester, to isolate, Fallen angels only. Okay? So the first thing is, it doesn't apply to me. Okay? So we can put it out of mind as far as we are concerned because it applies to foreign angels, for, uh, fallen angels, excuse me. And two, it doesn't mean hell. It means caverns of gloom. It's mistranslated. Isn't that interesting? Okay? Now what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, that there is a practice uh, over centuries of purposeful mistranslation to put fear on the people to make them dependent on their leaders, Amen. their religious leaders, Amen. to make them dependent on their religions, to make them dependent on their churches. You see? Because the early church, the Roman Catholic Church, taught outside of the church there is no salvation. As a matter of fact, if you look in the Catholic Catechism, you will discover that it is still taught today as uh, part of official doctrine of Rome. Outside of the Roman Church there is no salvation. See? So, what we see in all of this is that it's a uh, mistranslation, okay, of all of these words, Gehenna, Hades, Tartarus. What I've done today is I've taken you through every single scripture of the New Testament in which the word hell is mentioned. And I have demonstrated to you that not one of those scriptures means hell. Not a single one of them. Okay, now where are we at in our study? 
what we are at is we have seen that the Old Testament word Sheol does not mean hell. So there's no Old Testament seed for a New Testament reality. Okay, then I've taken you through all the New Testament verses in which the word hell is mentioned, and I have taken you through the translational meanings to demonstrate to you that in the New Testament, none of those words mean hell, so there is neither Old Testament type nor New Testament reality of hell in the Bible. Okay, the reality is that it's a contrivance of men I proved that to you historically in the last session in which a number of ancient historians wrote down that all of those pagan doctrines came from Egyptian mystery religions, Greek mystery religions, and Persian mystery religions, that they were adapted as a convenience by leaders and philosophers to scare people into being moral, that they were brought into the early church through uh, Jerome, Augustine, probably Tertullian, uh, okay, and later perpetuated by the King James translators, who knew that they were false doctrines, contrivances, fables, if you will, but that they were convenient to control the masses and make them behave more civilly. So they decided to use them. I quoted for you last week a historical quotation from Augustine who admitted and acknowledged that these things were historically true. <clears throat> and then amazingly used them anyway to bring them into Catholic doctrine to control Christians in the early church. What is the issue? The issue is it's a lie. That's what the issue is. The issue is that John 4.24 says God is a spirit and those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. Amen. Now you're going to turn around and say, but wait a minute, Vern, are you saying that God won't judge anyone? I never said that. I never said that. I said that there is a judgment. And I said that that judgment for the wicked, the evil people of existence, and the practicing sinners is a judgment in the lake of fire, but that it's a remedial judgment according to what the word for lake of fire and brimstone is, the Greek word theon, which means God, God fire. You see, the confused earthly carnal church under religious witchcraft teaches that the lake of fire is a place of eternal torment and damnation forever and ever. That is ministering to people that the lake of fire, which is eternal destruction, okay, is attributable to the Holy Spirit. If it weren't for ignorance, that would come within one hair's breadth of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, attributing Satan's ministry to the Holy Spirit. Just with a hair spin. The only thing that doesn't make it blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is willful and intentional. And that's out of ignorance. You see, the point I'm saying to you is that when you speak, when you let Scripture interpret Scripture, Scripture says that our God is a consuming fire. So God takes out, consumes out of people all that is not uh, in line with his will and character and he leaves on fire all that is. Okay? The pain and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth is not from physical pain of flames. That's a spiritual fire of the Holy Spirit. It's the pain and the suffering that comes <coughs> from recognizing one's own sin and condition. Because the Holy Spirit is like a mirror. Say. And because no one can escape the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Say. These are people who would not deal with their issues in human life. Okay. And the reality now is payday someday. 
okay? If they were not willing to deal with the issues of human life and sin in this existence, the Holy Spirit will deal with them with that in that existence. How do you know that, Vern? Because it says they will be tested day and night in the presence of the angels and the Lamb. In the presence of the angels and the Lamb. The angels and the Lamb will be in the lake of fire with them. Doing what? Ministry. Our God is a consuming fire. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of life. Amen. Scripture says all live unto Him. Huh? That God may be all in all, not all in some. And the rest go on to roast and toast. False doctrine. Apostate church. See, we've got to get apostasy out of us. Say. Does Old Testament confirm that? You bet. Listen to this. Psalm 68, verse 20. He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. But guess what? In the literal Hebrew, it doesn't say the issues from death. In the literal Hebrew, here's what it says. He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord, watch this, belongs the exits from death. To God the Lord belongs the exits from Sheol, the exits from Hades. Wow. Wow. Uh -huh. Praise God. Uh -huh. I thought... Damnation was eternal. I mean, that's what they taught me when I was a little boy. Okay? Wow. That if you got on the bad side of God, you were going to roast and toast forever. Okay? If to God belonged the exits of from death, then how can... And that's the word Sheol. That how... Can, how can Hades or Sheol mean eternal hell? Can't be eternal if there's an exit from it. Hmm? What am I doing, folks? I'm letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Okay? Just bear with me now as we conclude. I just want to show you um, a couple things so that we can just uh, gel this whole thing. Okay? First thing I want you to uh, be aware of. I suppose, in a sense, when we teach this stuff, we teach how sick the church has become. Amen. Say, how unhealthy the church has become. Maligns the character of God. You know, Moses sinned against God. And God told him he sinned. Alright? But when Moses sinned against God, okay, listen to what God said to him. He didn't say, Moses, you're going to Sheol. I got news for you. When Moses sinned against God, there was no redemption yet. At least on the earth. There was a redemption in the Spirit. Right? Because it says the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. See? So everybody's salvation has been taken care of from before the foundation of the world. Hello? Amen. Hello? Huh? Has been taken care of before the foundation of the world. Okay? 
It had not yet been uh, walked out in space and time. Amen. Christ had not yet come to pay the price of sin. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yep. Okay? So it was done conditionally in the spirit. It was not done physically in reality. Okay? Now watch what God said to Moses. This will blow your socks off. And the Lord spoke up to Moses that self same day, saying, Get you up into the mountain Arabim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession, and die on the mount where you go up, and be gathered unto your people. As Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered unto his people. He didn't say, go and die and go to Sheol. Go and die and go to Hades, you sinned against me. Listen to what he continued to say. Because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because you sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet you shall see the land, but you shall not go in unto the land which I gave the children of Israel. Here's a perfect example of what we said before. God deals with sin in the here and now. God does not deal with sin in the afterlife. The judgment is in the here Amen. and now. Yes. So, in yes. the here and now. He says, you trespassed against me. Huh? But he, did he say, go to Sheol, go to hell? Moses, you trespassed against me. Okay? No. He says, go up on the mount and die and go home to your family. Like your brother Aaron went up on Mount Hor and died and went home to his family. Hallelujah. See? We're dealing with an ancient language. When it says, okay, go up, die on the mount where you go, be gathered unto your people. That's another way of saying in modern English, go home to your family. Go home to your ancestors. See? Moses was in sin. I got news for you. There was not a record at all that Moses ever repented. Wow. Okay? Now watch this. Watch this. Matthew 17. And after six days, verses 1 and 3. After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, John, his brother, brings them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, watch this, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Moses and Elijah. So here in the Old Testament, God says to Moses, Moses, go up on the mountain, die, and be gathered unto your people. In other words, go home to your family. Not to hell. While he was yet in sin, and there had been no repentance. Okay? And also... He said, as your brother Aaron went up on Mount Hor and died and went home to his family. And then the next thing here in Matthew 17, we see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Amen. Does that prove to you all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, God is not a respecter of persons. Am I right? Does the book of Acts say that? Amen. 
God is not a respecter of persons. Okay? And Moses is up there with Jesus and Elijah. Okay? Even though he had sinned. Oh boy, this is good stuff. I gotta tell you. That's great stuff. <laughs> Dear God. What a merciful God. Amen. How we malign the character of God. That's right. hmm? See, I gotta tell you something. Repentance is a grace. Amen. Repentance has to be given to you. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. It's all of him and none of you. Amen. All of him and none of me. Hallelujah. Huh? Yes. It's got to be given. Please God. Okay? Amen. Moses was given repentance. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Want another proof? Here's the last one. Yes. John 8, verse 1 on. Listen to this. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say you? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. You know what he was writing, don't you? Their sins. <laughs> so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Mm -hmm. What? Their sins. <laughs> and they which heard it being convicted, watch this, being convicted by their own conscience. Amen. By their own conscience. By their own conscience. How could they be convicted by their own conscience when they read down and they read their sin? See, they got convicted. Okay? Went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I con uh, condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen. I got news for you. Amen. That woman did not repent. That woman did not ask Jesus for forgiveness. Nowhere is there a record of that in that passage. He just asked her a question. Yes. Who condemns you? And she says, no one, Lord. And he says, neither do I. Go your way and sin no more. Amen. Okay? Isn't that interesting? But the end time carnal earthly church under religious witchcraft will teach you that you will be condemned for your sin forever and ever where over and over again in this narrative of Moses, in this narrative of of the woman caught in adultery, we see a picture of the heart of the Father. Okay? The heart of the Father. Moses didn't repent, to my knowledge. Okay? This woman didn't repent, at least not verbally. Okay? But they were given the grace of repentance. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Say, they were given the grace of repentance. Okay? Which means that the true Christian faith walk is not performance. Okay? You can only conceive of hell and damnation as a consequence of your Christian or failure of your Christian faith walk 
Okay, the only way you could ever conceive of that is through your lack of understanding of grace. Through your lack of understanding that it is all of Him and none of you. There's only one way anyone could ever end up in a hell if it ever did exist, and that would be through their own performance not satisfying God. So he has to let him go. Here's a bunch he just couldn't do anything with, as if he was impotent or didn't care enough about it. See? That's performance. That's works. You are saved by grace through faith. And that, not of your own. Ooh. Not of your own effort. Not of your own. It is the grace of God, not of works, Amen. so that no man can boast. Amen? Amen. Give God the glory. Amen. God is Father, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for your graciousness. Lord, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for your truth. We give you thanks, praise, and glory, Lord Christ, for your love. We thank you that you love all and that you are taking a, a chaotic creation and bringing order where there is total disorder. That you are bringing love where there is no love. That you are bringing healing where there is no healing, Lord. That you are bringing fruit where there is no fruit, Lord Christ. That you are bringing truth where there is no truth, Amen. Lord Christ. We thank you, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you lead us into all truth. Yes, Jesus. To your glory. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We give you all the adoration. And we bless your name, one with Father and the Holy Spirit. And the saints said in agreement. Amen. 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 Glory to God.